course, our conference is entitled, Is Genesis History? The book of Genesis is much broader than just chapters 1 and 2, or chapters 1 through 8, where we have the flood. Uh, and it's even bigger than Genesis 1 through 11. Of course, Genesis 1 through 11 is a, is a unit before we come to the beginning of the patriarchs, beginning with, uh, with uh, Abram, going all the way down to Jacob and Joseph. Um, but because it's so much richer and c covers so much more of, of the period of biblical history, we don't want to lose sight of the other important parts of Genesis. So our fo focus today is going to be on essentially the lives of Jacob and Joseph. And I want to, to some measure, not a complete measure until our other session picks this up, but uh, prove to you that we have historical evidence for Jacob and Joseph. And more than that, there are three other biblical figures related to them. The two sons of Joseph, the two eldest sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh being the older, but Ephraim being the one who is exalted uh, among the two. And then one of Ephraim's obscure sons named uh, Shechem. So uh, that those three figures we'll be looking at in tomorrow's session, but today we want to look at uh, Jacob and Joseph. So, the title is Evidence of Joseph and Jacob in Egypt. And as way, by way of background, I want to give you a little bit in the area of chronology just so that you understand um, the basis on which this is built. And the reason this is necessary is because there are different chronological views out there. Uh, there is a late Exodus view that suggests that it's the 13th century BC when the Israelites leave Egypt in the Exodus. And if that's the case, then the numbers change as you go back in time to Jacob and Joseph's era. Because according to uh, Exodus 12, 40 and 41, it's 480 year, 430 years to the very day before the Exodus that Jacob enters into Egypt with his family to live there permanently for God to protect them. So, um, because of those numbers, obviously, being, you know, taking you uh, not, not back as far in history if you believe in the late Exodus, so let's say if, if 1250 is your year for the Exodus, 430 years would be 1680 B.C. Well, that doesn't work with, with the proper synchronization of, of, biblical, of, of Israelite history and, and Egyptian history. What only works is if you have 1446 as the year for the Exodus, and then go back 430 years from that. Um, and of course, there are other views out there, such as a 215-year sojourn, which uh, is not really a, a, the correct view. The correct view is the 430 years in Exodus 12, 40, and 41 which is actually confirmed by the proper exegetical treatment in Galatians chapter 3 of the 430 years mentioned there. In that text, many biblical historians and, and uh, uh, weekend Bible enthusiasts uh, interpret that to mean that it was 430 years from Abram. Uh, for, but that's not what the text says. The nearest antecedent there is not Abram. It's his seed, one of his seed, and it's given in plural. And uh, the final seed who receives the promise directly is Jacob himself in the very year that they go down to, uh, to live in Egypt. So that's when the clock starts for the 430 years to be counted uh, until the time of the Exodus. So Galatians 3 is often misinterpreted, um, and the, the, the period of the sojourn is changed because of that misinterpretation. So um, we want to look at the um, chronology that, that I think fits much better, much tighter. So taking 900, uh, 967 B.C. as the year when the construction begins on the first temple, that's what the, the Israelites, the, or the, the Jewish people today, the Israelis, will call uh, the temple that we usually refer to as the Solomonic Temple. The, Celts, the temple built under the uh, authority and, and commission of Solomon because David wasn't allowed to build it. 
So 967 is when the construction began. 1 Kings 6.1 says that in the 480th year uh, after the Exodus, that's when the construction began. Well, because of Neo-Assyrian uh, synchronisms, we're able to nail down 967 as the right year for the construction of the temple. But then we would go 479 years and change because it's the 480th year, not 480 years. It's the difference between a cardinal and an ordinal number. 479 years and change goes back to 1446 uh, B.C. So that's, that's our hard and fast year for the Exodus. In my 2006 Master Seminary Journal article on the Exodus Pharaoh, I try to prove that it takes place on the 24th of April, even more specifically. And that can be confirmed through um, astro uh, astronomical evidence. Then, according to... Uh, Exodus 12, 40, 41, we go 430 years back from that, and that takes us to 1876, the year when Jacob moved his family to Egypt. So that is our hard and fast peg in the ground in the, um, in the absolute timeline. Now, I don't want to walk through all of the evidence for the, chron the chrono chronological issues and prove to you that this is the right chronological system. I could do that, but... Um, we're going to skip all of the evidence. I would simply say this in very overview summary fashion uh, that the chronological system developed by Usher has, is filled with flaws and that the most careful, most accurate, most thorough chronological study ever undertaken was that done by a German-American named Edwin Thiele and his work is extremely well thought through, extremely solid, and um, he provides a true basis which uh, very carefully, very accurately deals with the, um, the different uh, calendar systems within Israel and Judah, and at times uh, the Nisan calendar is used, at times the, the Tishri calendar is used, and he unravels all of the difficulties um, that are inherent within the, the issues of chronology. Very few flaws in his work. The few flaws that are in his work, just about all of them, I would guess, were resolved for my, for my liking by a man named Roger Young, who I believe to be the best living uh, biblical chronologist. Uh, he's a dear friend, and he's written excellent, excellent uh, journal articles. So I'd advise you to go to his academy.edu website or his personal website, download those if you're really interested in chronology. He tightens up any screws that Tila may have left loose. And, um, and yet, they're, even, in, even among those, they're very minor to begin with. What was his name? Uh, Edwin Tila and Roger Young. So look for the, the journal articles of Roger Young, R-O-D-G-E-R-Y-O-U-N-G. And, uh, and Young especially uh, helps by showing extra biblical evidence that will, that will reinforce the date of 1446 as the proper year for the evidence, looking at um, uh, various forms of evidence. So um, consider all of those as what will prove to you that 1446 is the right year for the Exodus. Then, of course, we have to uh, deal with Egyptian chronology because if we're going to talk about Israelites in Egypt, we have to know their chronology, and more importantly, or just as importantly, at least, we have to synchronize properly Israelite chronology and history with Egyptian chronology and history. Because if we misconnect, we can elaborate all we want about connections between the two, when in fact we're arbitrarily, maybe accidentally, creating these uh, inaccuracies because we haven't done a careful job of synchronizing properly. And actually, 1876 for the year Jacob moves in to Egypt and 1446 for the Exodus, those fit perfectly with not only Egyptian chronology, but Egyptian history. And they fit precisely to a T. If I had more time, I would show you examples of that. So Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian chronological scheme uh, begins with the pre-dynastic period, which goes through what's called Dynasty Zero. It's more of a political term than a chronological term, Dynasty Zero, but um, that comes first. It's difficult to say when it, when it begins. It's typically dated around 4,000 or so BC, but um, 
uh, I, I believe we have problems with that date that um, can be resolved. So probably sometime uh, very early in the third millennium BC, we have the beginning of the pre-dynastic period. And then the early dynastic period, dynasties one and two, the old kingdom, dynasties three through eight, that's where we have the pyramids built. That's between 2500 approximately and 2170. The first intermediate period when Egypt becomes weak, they no longer become the unified two lands. The Hebrew word for uh, Egypt is Mitzrayim. And Mitzrayim is in the dual, which means a pair. In English, we have singular and plural. Hebrew and Middle Egyptian have singular, plural, and dual. So plural only begins with three and up. Well, in Hebrew, Mitzrayim is in dual because Egypt is known as the two lands. There's upper Egypt, in the south, and there's lower Egypt in the north. And the Israelites understood that and incorporated it into their term for Egypt, which is really fascinating. So what we want to deal with, though, is the Middle Kingdom, which is approximately 2025 B.C. to 1674 B.C., covering uh, part of Dynasty 11 and going through part of Dynasty 13. So Dynasty 12 is completely within the Middle Kingdom, and that is the dynasty of Joseph's day and Jacob's day that we're going to be focusing on today. So, Dynasty 12, this is a king list according to the, uh, the reigns that I've worked out after uh, long uh, and careful work, a lot of revising along the way. I can't even guarantee I'm finished revising the, the exact dates of these kings. But you can find this, again, on my academia.edu web, website and download the PDF, which will give you Dynasties 12, 18, 19, and 20, I believe, the real years of all of the Egyptian kings. So our focus, though, is going to be on just a, a few of those kings. So if I, again, if I had more time to prove it to you, I'd go into the um, astronomical evidence behind how we know we can date Egyptian chronology with precision. Um, that astronomical evidence provides, through the uh, observance of, of the rising of the Sothis star in the sky, provides um, a 25-year window where scholars who do accept astronomical evidence uh, agree or disagree with one another. So there's the high chronology, uh, the middle chronology, which only begins 13 years, it's, it's, it's 13 years offset from the high chronology, and then the um, uh, the low chronology, which is only 25 from the high chronology. So there's only a 25-year window of difference among scholars who accept astronomical evidence as, as accurate. There is a, uh, a, a papyrus from Lahun, the site of Lahun in Middle Egypt. Um, it's, uh, it's actually, this is incorrect, it's British Museum papyrus 10012. Uh, that was found in, um, at, in, in, the, in the Fayum in 1899. It, re, it records one of these helical risings of Sothis, and it ties it to the king um, at the time, who is Sesostris III. So Sesostris III's reign can be um, a tent peg, if you will, for the entire 12th dynasty. So if you know the right renal lengths of all of the kings of the 12th dynasty, you know exactly when they... Um, would have ruled on our absolute timeline. So that being the case, uh, the, the papyrus dated to year seven of his reign, and that allows us to establish with confidence the dating for the um, entire 12th dynasty um, set of kings that we have. So again, we won't be going into a detailed discussion of all this evidence. Um, you can see this in the, in the DVD. It's up, it'll be up here long enough that you can hit pause if you get it, and you can read through all of this and contact me if you have any questions or want to discuss it. So that takes us to uh, Avaris, the site of Avaris, which is the hometown of Jacob. You know it in the Bible, in Exodus 1 or uh, what is it? Uh, well, we'll look at the passage in Genesis in a little bit, but you'll, you'll know it as the site of Ramses. Now, we have a problem with the site of Ramses, which we're going to discuss very soon, but first we want to um, focus in on Avaris. So we start with our, with our tree, with Abram, 
um, being the uh, the the not you know not not the first in his line, of course. He he had his own line before him, but he's the first in the promised line, uh, the line that that God promised uh, to be His covenant people. Begins with Abraham, uh, Abram, who later becomes Abraham, who was born in Ur, then his son Isaac, born in the Negev, which is in Canaan, and then his son Jacob takes on that mantle, who's also called Israel, and he's born in Canaan as well. Then uh, to him is born uh, Joseph among the twelve uh, sons of Jacob. And it's through Joseph that we have Ephraim and Manasseh, who's, whose uh, uh, identity we can um, pinpoint in Egypt itself. So they, of course, Ephraim and Manasseh, it's important to note, they were born in Lahun. Uh, I, I would say in the city of Lahun. It's not listed in the Bible. It just tells us that they were born in Egypt. But Lahun is the most logical site for it. And if I had more time, I could prove that to you as well. So let's look at the biblical text that will introduce us to this passage. And especially get us involved in this controversy of, of Ramses. Um, so it says this in chapter 47, verse 11, my translation. Now Joseph settled his father and his brothers, and he gave them property in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, just as that which Pharaoh had commanded. So we note here that Ramses II lived uh, and ruled from 1290 to 1223. He's the one who built Paramesi, the city of Paramesi, as his capital city, the capital of the 19th dynasty. So being that the site of Ramses, or, or P. Ramesi, was, or Per Ramses, was not built until the 19th dynasty, the problem comes, well, how do we account for a biblical site where Jacob would settle and where uh, Moses would, would, you know, from where he would launch the Exodus, um, how do we account for a site that wasn't there yet if the Exodus happened in the 15th century B.C. and the site of, of P. Ramsey was only built in the 13th century B.C.? Well, believe it or not, the late Exodus people will never tell you this, but that problem can be solved with utter ease. How? Well, I don't often uh, recommend Wikipedia as a scholarly source, but since everybody uses it, I want you to see there's something excellent here in Wikipedia. If you look under the site of Kantir, and that's the name for uh, the, the Arabic name for the site of Per Ramesses, where you know, Ram Ramesses II built up his great capital, it says this in red. The ancient site of what? Of Varis. Not Ramses or Per Ramesses. But Avaris is located around two kilometers south of Kantir. This was the older site in this area. Later on, Avaris was absorbed by P. Ramesses. They make this comment because, and correctly so, that P. Ramesses and Avaris essentially became one and the same to the Egyptians. Now, they don't really give you the evidence here on this Wikipedia page as to why we know that's true, but we can look at this together. Well, the evidence is mainly contained in an inscription on a shrine door dating to the 20th dynasty of Egypt, so that's in the Ramesside period, even after the 19th dynasty of Ramses II, and that inscription is now located in the Pushkin Museum in Russia, that's the nation of Russia, um, and it mentions a certain priest called a Wab priest of the god Amun who was located at the harbor of Avaris. Therefore, what we have here is we have an anachronism. Um, we have a reference in the biblical text to the site of Ramses that's a later name for the city much after the, the time of the Exodus and the time of Jacob. Um, this is known as a textual update. There's an excellent, excellent article by a professor at the Master's Seminary. That's my alma mater. My Master of Divinity and Master of Theology degrees were there. He's an Old Testament professor. He wrote this article and published it in Jets in 2001. You want to read this, get a copy. It's downloadable for free on the, on the Internet. 
probably on his academia.edu webpage. It's called The Place of Textual Updating in an Inerrant View of Scripture. And the bottom line is, you can't get away from the fact that in certain places, there are updates added to the text that scribes included during the process of the entire inscripturation of, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, they exercised under the, I believe, under the, the, uh, the oversight of the Spirit of God, um, a, a number of these such additions, one being the end of the, the book of Deuteronomy, which describes the time period way after Moses was already dead and gone from the earth. And it's, it's simple to understand if you realize that a scribe came by, and at some point later after that, he simply updated the text. Now, how do we know that this is true? Well, because of that inscription, um, we know that, okay, Per, per Ramesi is located here in the upper right, and all of this below and to the, to the left, to your left, is the site of, of Avaris. So this is Per Ramesi. So in the 19th and 20th dynasties, that was the great capital of the Egyptian nation. And the people mainly lived up in this area, so the Wa priest probably lived somewhere here, and he took a trip down to um, the harbor right here, which is on the Pelusiac branch of the Nile River, and he was essentially jumping up and down and saying, I'm here at the harbor of Avaris. He didn't say Paramesi. He said, I'm here at the harbor of Avaris. What does that mean? It means in the minds of the Egyptians that Avaris wasn't just this, the ancient, more ancient site that goes back to earlier dynasties and earlier periods, but Avaris is also this. So it's all one and the same site, not completely divisible sites. Therefore, you have reason to suggest uh, and support the notion of a later Israelite scribal update to change the name, which I believe would have been per, Peru Nefer, when Moses actually penned it, and later it was changed to Per Ramesses. Uh, and they did it not to confuse people, but to allow their readers to understand the correct site name for, um, um, for what it was in their day. Because in the day of the later Israelites, they wouldn't have known about Peru Nefer. They wouldn't have known that, that this, this was Peru Nefer at the time that Moses um, led the Israelites out of Egypt. It was, a, it was a term that had gone out of use for the site. So um, they, they updated the text because it's true and accurate this is, that this is all one site in the, in the minds of the Egyptians, and so therefore in the Israelites' minds, it was one of the same site too, and that's why they updated the text. All right, so we're going to be looking at the occupational areas of R1 and F1. R1 is where in the 12th dynasty, during the lifetime of Jacob and Joseph, the Egyptians already had um, an occupation there, and where you see in the top of this in the black, right, right to the left of R1, and that's one in Roman numerals, uh, was their temple to the originator of the 12th dynasty, which is Amenemhat the I. He's the founder of the 12th dynasty. So once he was dead, they, of course, deified him, and they built the temple to honor him and to worship um, so that was their, their enclave. Well, Asiatics and Israelites, of course, qualify as Asiatics because the Levant begins Asia to the east of the Mediterranean, just as to the north of the Mediterranean, uh, modern Turkey, ancient Anatolia begins Asia. All of that is Asia. So everyone will admit that Asiatics in the 12th dynasty moved to Egypt, specifically to the site of Avaris, and they settled there, and they settled in F1, which is on the left side of the screen, and you see all those black spots. Those are where uh, Manfred Bietok, an Austrian uh, archaeologist, and his crew uh, excavated, and this has been going on, I believe, since the 1960s. It's been a conti virtually continuous uh, um, excavation project, and they don't know it, probably, but they are uncovering incredible things that will teach us about the ancient Israelites when they moved to, um, to Avaris. So um, this is a phasing scheme uh, to show you the periodization of, um, 
of the area, when it was inhabited, when it wasn't, etc., when certain area, when certain parts of this um, of Avaris and so forth uh, were, were inhabited. So, for our purposes, um, this column here, R1, is what we are going to be looking at, and especially even more so, F1. Now. Uh, the further down it is, the older you are, the older you, uh, it is, and the, the further back you go in time. So as we look further up, um, the time goes along toward our day. So it starts with early Bronze Age 4 in the Levant, which is equal to Dynasties 10 and 11, um, and into Dynasty 12 in, in Egypt, and so forth. So our focus is going to be right in this area here, where uh, we have an occupation in, um, in C1 and 2, and then following that, um, actually in F1, we want to look at D2, the small d, forward slash um, Arabic 2, and then D1. Those are the two main occupational phases uh, that begin the um, Asiatic residence there that I'm attributing to the Israelites. I and many others, Bryant Wood and and, and many others would agree with this. So, um, let's see if there's anything more. Oh, a couple chronological considerations within the 12th dynasty, looking uh, at the time from 1876 down to 1859. So, it's 1885 when Joseph uh, interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. 1878 is the year when um, Sosoris the second and third um, have a transition, so Sesostris II dies, and Sesostris III comes onto the throne, and this actually happens to be, it ha happens to coincide with the very year when we have a transition from the seven years of abundance to the seven years of famine. It's convenient, I didn't plan it that way, it just worked out like that. Um, but we can refer with confidence to Sesostris II as the abundance pharaoh, Sesostris III as the famine pharaoh. Then, of course, 1876, we know that year. 1859, that's the year that, jo that Jacob dies. And we have another coincidence of two important events in the same year. Not only does Jacob die in that year, but we have a transition where Sesostris III brings his son, Amenemchat III, onto the throne, and they rule together as co-regents. And the way it worked in the ancient world, at least in Egypt, was that the younger pharaoh, the son who joined his father on the throne, he's the one who did all of the daily duties of the pharaoh. He had to run the country. The father was smart enough to go into semi-retirement and just enjoy life as a uh, king who had you know, accomplished great feats in his reign and now could enjoy the rest of his life. 1805 is when Joseph dies. So, Sosostris II, who is he? The Abundance Pharaoh. Sosostris III, the Famine Pharaoh. Amenemhat III, he's the Pharaoh whose rule began in the year of Jacob's death. And so for now, we want to look, not really at D1, that will be in tomorrow's session, but we want to look at stratum D2. Remember, a stratum is an archaeological level that can be uh, um, reached by excavation, and so when you reach that level, that's... The D2 is the first Asiatic uh, occupation at the site of Avaris that I'm suggesting to you we can connect to Jacob. So, uh, Avaris, two years after Jacob's arrival, we're going to secure the dating of the site with an inscription that was found, in, and it was published in, eight, in 1959 by a man named Shahata Adam. Unfortunately, his, his translation of this inscription is very faulty in many ways. And he doesn't even get the, the correct gist of the inscription. But it's going to be in the second book I'm writing, and hopefully we'll finish by the end of the summer of 2017, or 2018, and uh, hopefully soon after that we'll hit publication. Um, but I will, I will um, offer a, a translation of the entire inscription that really shows something very different. Well, if you look at, in yellow, uh, this is uh, the hieroglyphic way of saying the renal year of a certain king. And then in green is the uh, birth name. And every pharaoh had five names, five official names. At birth, he receives one. The birth name of Sesostris III, who is the 
famine pharaoh is um, listed in, in green there, Senwasret, also known as Sesostris. Um, so we know from a lot of different reasons that, that this is definitely Sesostris III. So um, the value of this inscription is that it served as a sealed contract between Asiatics and Egyptian priests, and its date is 1874 B.C., which, um, uh, which happens to be renal, his renal year, year five or five years into the, uh, into the famine, the fifth year into the famine. So here's what the inscription says, and we can skip all of the preliminaries and go right down to line six, where it says, the digging of a dike for the temple estate of Amenemkhat I. So remember, Amenemkhat I is the founder of the 12th dynasty. The Egyptians made a temple for him to worship him, and it was located just to the south of that part of the Pelusiac branch of the Nile that would make its way off to the north into the Mediterranean Sea. So they needed to dig a dike for this temple estate. Well, guess what? If you study Joseph's life and in Egypt, well, if I, if I were to show all, you, all of this to you, you would see that Joseph was about many things, but one of them was about building dikes. And the greatest dike that he built was at the site of Lahum, where he probably first went after he was elevated by Pharaoh. And that began what's known as the exploitation of the Fayum. If you look at a map, a satellite map of Egypt, you'll see this line of vegetation where the Nile goes all the way up to the Mediterranean. And then part way up, you'll see this little, this little vegetation area off to the left, and that's the Fayum. Every Egyptologist who knows the 12th dynasty will tell you the exploitation of the Fayum as a breadbasket for Egypt only began in the reign of Sesostris II. Who is he according to biblical chronology? the abundance pharaoh. So Lahun is where Joseph would have settled first to be able to complete that operation to begin the mass production of grain to supply Egypt that could be used both for them and for storage and for selling to foreigners at the time of the famine. So there's a digging of a dike here at Avaris for the temple estate of Amenemkhat I, the justified, at the mouth of the path that is alongside the waters of this city north of the temple. The length of the mouth of the path that was uprooted was 26 cubits, and that is approximately 13.6 meters. The stella, right, because this is written on a stella, we saw that stone stella. It looks like a tombstone with hieroglyphic inscription on it. The stella was sealed, right? You have a signet ring or, you know, you wear it around your neck, and you seal it by the hand of the sem priest. That's one person. His name is Eep and two, second person, and by the overseer of the administrative division of foreign land. And he is a foreigner. There's a hieroglyph next to his, his uh, title that is, an Asia, that is a, a Levantine person. So he's clearly a Levantine person. So there's, a, there's a, an Egyptian priest. He's probably in charge of all the priests for the temple there. And then there's an Asiatic who, whose derivation is the Levant. And of course, Canaan is part of the Levant, the southern Levant. So they make this pact together. They, they both sign with their signet rings this, this stella. And I, I bet you 28 cents that if you go and look at that stella today, you could turn it over and either on the back of it or on one of the sides, you will find two seal marks. I haven't gone and seen it myself. I'll bet you that they are there because that's what the inscription tells us. Um, and then his name, the name of the Asiatic, Horus. And Horus is who? He's the king of the gods in the Egyptian pantheon. The king of the gods is in his son. That's his name. And implied the Levantine because of that, uh, that hieroglyph that shows that he's a person from the Levant. Then something new, something different. The workmanship is of my hand. Now we come to first person. Who is my? Who am I here? Well, he defines himself. He says, I am the head of the household. That's a title. I am son of Sobek. That's a name. 
and then he calls himself the ruler of this city. He is a big shot who is the mayor or ruler or who oversees the entire site of Avaris. He has sovereignty there. He's a great man. Um, and then it says this, and I believe this is a reduplication. He's calling himself another name. Why? Because the Egyptians probably called him two names. Horus is at the forefront, son of Horus is at the forefront, senior. So there's a Horus is at the forefront, you know, king of the gods is at the forefront, senior, and there's a king of the gods is at the forefront, junior. And he's calling himself junior, who is senior. Well, I'll let the cat out of the bag and suggest to you that senior is Jacob himself. And that Jacob is also on this stella as the overseer of the administrative division of foreign land. And he's also called Horus, the king of the gods, is in his son. So Jacob is called two names, and I think Joseph is the other person, and he's called two names. Son of Sobek, and the king of the gods is at the forefront. That I'm going to attempt to prove to you both today and tomorrow. The identity of Sa Sobek and Horamkat Jr. Who is this guy? And I've already told you, so you know, right? But you're saying to me, and legitimately so, prove it to me. I would love to thank you for the opportunity. So if you look in the red, this gives us a description of this person in first person who had, who's responsible either for the, for the, for the uh, inscribing of the stella or the construction of the dike, or both. Either way, he is the controller of the entire city of Avaris. So he is a big wig. And it says here that the craftsmanship is of my hand, and then it says, head of the household. Since I can't use a laser pointer here, there's head, this and this, and this is a house, head of, head of the household, and then it's this hieroglyph that has no pronunciational value. I like to call this affectionately the touchdown hieroglyph because he is definitely saying six points here, right? Uh, that hieroglyph shouldn't be used there. It's out of place, absolutely out of whack. What you should have there is a normal seated man hieroglyph that you can see right here. That is to designate you're a, a person. The fact that the touchdown hieroglyph there, it goes back to the meaning connected with that hieroglyph, which is one of two things. Either that's the, the uh, uh, there's the meaning jubilation there, that's the hieroglyph connected with, with praising or showing jubilation, or it's the hieroglyph for something or someone who is extremely high or tall. Now, I don't think he's calling himself a tall man, I don't think he's calling himself a jubilant man here. I think, in the context, calling himself head of a household. What household? Pharaoh's household. This is a typical title used of Pharaoh's house. He's saying, I'm the head of a household, and I'm a high person. That's who he is. He is a high person. You can't dispute that. Well, you can, but you can't get away with it. And then it gives his name which is, you see the alligator, the crocodile, it doesn't look like a crocodile at the end of that line, but it is. To our left of the touchdown hieroglyph, that's a crocodile um, or alligator. And, um, and then this first hieroglyph here is the saw bird, and that means son. So it's son of Sobek. Well, who is Sobek? Sobek is the god connected with the alligator. And he is especially known as the god who, um, who, who um, nourishes and enriches through the life-giving waters of the Nile River. That's the association of the god Sobek. Now, what did Joseph do? Well, again, I'm not, I don't have time to show it to you, but if I did, I would show you that he, through his work accomplished at Lahoon, used the life-giving waters of the Nile River to allow life to blossom in Egypt during the time of the famine. That's what he did. So I believe that the Egyptians saw that and knew that and gave him that name, son of Sobek, 
because of his role in using the life-giving waters of the Nile to provide for the Egyptian people. Does that make sense? You with me so far? Good. Okay. Um, then, um, let's look. Okay, so the year here for our Stella, found at Avaris, is year five of the famine pharaoh Sesostris III. Now we're going to jump forward in time with another inscription. And that inscription, so Avaris, if I didn't show you on the map, is right here in the eastern Nile Delta. We're going to go down into Sinai um, to one of the two sites where turquoise mines, uh, well, expeditions were launched to two different turquoise mines, one being at Maghara and another being at Serbit el Khadim. Uh, Maghara really was probably um, exploited earlier and they didn't probably find as much as they wanted to and kind of gave up on it midpoint during the 12th dynasty, but it was, um, it was a place where they ventured to during the reign of Amenemhat III. So this site featured three mining camps in antiquity and it was mined during Dynasty 12, the lifetime of Joseph and his children. Well, remember I told you that as the chronology works, that the year Jacob dies, that same year that Jacob dies in 1859 BC, we have a transition. Amenemhat III comes onto the throne and he begins what year of his renal of his reign in Egypt? Year one, right? That's 1859. Look at this inscription. Year two, year two of Amenemhat III. We have the touchdown hieroglyph in positions it should not occupy. You should not begin a word or a sentence with a touchdown hieroglyph. Why? It's not pronounced. It's a determinative. It's supposed to be at the end of a word all the time. This is absolutely anomalous here. This is not good Middle Egyptian, folks. So, who did this? Who's responsible for the touchdown hieroglyph in positions it shouldn't be found? Well, look at this, year six, four years later. Sinai 90, we see the same thing. And, and every one of these touchdown hieroglyphs, we're looking at vertical columns. You, you read down now, and every one of those lines begins with the touchdown hieroglyph. Again, terrible Middle Egyptian. Then, year 13 of Amenemhat III. Look at what we have now. Do you remember? Head of the household. Remember that? On year, the year five inscription at, at Avaris, we have that same connection with the touchdown hieroglyph. The exact same construction. So, either we have another very high person in the, in the, in the house of Pharaoh who's here on these mining expeditions, or Another possibility is that we have here one of the offspring, one of those who fits under the umbrella of Joseph, because Joseph as second in command in Egypt provides an umbrella of protection for all the Israelites. They connect themselves to him. And as such, they could connect themselves to the high head of the household. So this could be referring in an, in an, in an obscure way to Israelites under Joseph, if Joseph is the man named on the Esbet Rushdi Stella from year five of Sosris III at Avaris. Does that make sense? Then we have in year 32, another touchdown hieroglyph. So um, all of that shows us, oh, um, and, and here I want you to notice, this is very important, and this will be important for my uh, presentation later in the week where I'm uh, suggesting to you that Hebrew is the, is the language of the world's oldest alphabet, which scholars have not been able to identify for 150 years. So here we have the touchdown hieroglyph. Here we have head of, and now instead of the, the correct form for a house, which is actually, this is actually incorrect. It's, it's correct except that it should be a rectangle with a door, an open doorway. It shouldn't be a square in an open doorway. So that's not good, that's not carefully drawn um, uh, Middle Egyptian. But then here in the next line, you see that he even connects that bottom line, which Egyptian scribes didn't do. So 
even more bad Middle Egyptian. So that is a full um, rectangle, if you will. And then on this inscription, you see, just to the left of the head, you see two houses. One, so, and there's no, no open doorway, so that's bad. One of them is a rectangle, and the other is, it's more like a square, but if anything, it's a rectangular with the longer ends going up. So you see that the author of these inscriptions is probably connected to the Asiatics at Avaris from year five of Sosius III, and you see that he's now going off on his own, and he's modifying Egyptian hieroglyphics to fit his own way of writing, his own style, squaring and filling in the doorway for where you have a house. That is an extremely important thing to note. So, um, now, let me take you back to Avaris. We're going back to F1 and looking at the occupational level there. Um, and here, we see that the workmanship is of my hand, head of the household, son of Sobek, the controller of the city. So I want to answer the question, who historically is Sa Sobek of the 12th dynasty? We have an answer. So, on uh, seals, uh, this one, the first one being 1331, we have the inscription Iri Wepet, which is he who is at the top, used of Sasobek. So the name Sasobek shows up on this seal, right? Because, it, and it's really probably an impression, it's a seal impression. But the name Sasobek is there, and then the title, he who is at the top. What does that mean? He's at the top, folks. On seal 1340, where it says Sasobek, it reads, Chati en Chefet Cher, Vizier who is in the front, Sasobek. Wow, what is a Vizier? Second in command. Sasobek is second in command in Egypt. On seal 1335, you read this, just the translation now, the king's wise man. Sa Sobek, the Lord, the revered, may he live again. What did Joseph become in Egypt? Well, all of Pharaoh's what tried to interpret his dreams? Wise. Wise men. Mm -hmm. None of them proved wise in dreams, did they? Mm -hmm. Did he? Not one. No. Who did? Joseph. Who do we have here? Who is Sa Sobek? The king's wise man. Seal 1332, Sasobek is called the great controller of the city. Maybe that's a virus, it doesn't say on the, on the seal. But probably that is the capital city. And at the time it would be each Tawi, the capital of the 12th dynasty. So he is a great person, one who controls the most important city in Egypt. This is Sasobek, folks. This is Sasobek. Does it not fit Joseph's? biography perfectly? Well, mm -hmm. there's more. Okay. Um, now, at this point, uh, I'll tell you that I'm actually transitioning to part three, skipping part two. But um, what, what I will try to prove to you tomorrow is that what happened later in Joseph's life, remember earlier on in his life in Egypt, he's called Sasobek, and he's called Horamkot. Now, let me pause and, and, and say this. This is really important. Um, why would Joseph be called the king of the gods is at the forefront? Why? Because that's what Joseph was like. You receive a name in the ancient world when something distinguishes you to give you that name. You know what's beautiful about Joseph? Okay, Joseph is brought into Pharaoh's presence. He knows he's going to be interpreting this dream. He knows what's coming. You know, he was consulted and told that the Pharaoh had had this dream and you need to interpret it for him. He knows he's going to interpret the dream, but what, is jo what does Joseph say? It is not in me. That's what he says. It is not in me. And then he gives credit to God and says, it's the Lord who will give you the interpretation of the dream. It's not I. The Lord will do this for you. Who? The king of the gods. So when the Egyptians looked at Joseph, they said, wow, 
This guy puts the king of the gods at the forefront of everything he does and everything he says. He doesn't give himself credit. He gives credit to the king of the gods. So that's his name. That's what they would name him. They see him doing it all of the time. Wow, the king of the gods is at the forefront. He puts God first in everything he does. That's why he receives that name. So, that being the case, I suggest to you, and I'll try to prove it a little bit uh, tomorrow, is that Sasobek and, uh, and, and Horamkat Jr., that those two names later became conflated into one name, which is Sobek and Chat. The God who provides through the life-giving waters of the Nile River is at the forefront. That's the idea behind that one name that he, that he gets. So, without proving all of this to you, I want to show you who, Sas, who Sobek Emkat is. Well, we have to go to the site of Dashua, which you see here in the red, right there. That's Dashua, the site of Dashua. There were several pyramids of the dynasties, uh, the kings of Dynasty 12 that were built at Dashua, including those for Amenemkat II, that's before the... Uh, uh, Joseph is elevated in Egypt. In Egypt. Sesostris III, that's the famine pharaoh, and his son, Amenemkat III. Well, the pyramidal complex of Sesostris III, the famine pharaoh, helps to identify who Sobekemkat is. This is a picture of the dilapidated form, remains, of the pyramid of Sesostris II at Dashur. He was never buried there because a second burial site for him was constructed at South Abydos. Uh, upstream in Upper Egypt, and that's where he was buried. But his first tomb, his first pyramid, was built at Dashur. And looking at it now in this drawing from above, you see the large um, uh, pyramid here. That's the pyramid of the king, Sesostris III. There are royal pyramids on the left, on our left and right of it, and then there is a um, a courtyard. There, there's a wall around all of those royal pyramids to protect them so they're not looted or you know, desecrated or anything to make sure that they're um, nicely maintained. Well, we have a lot of other graves, especially smaller graves, in a cemetery, Middle Kingdom Cemetery in this area. Then we have an in-between, between these elaborate uh, pyramids and the common, or the, the more common, the, the less impressive tombs, we have three mastabas. We have this one that's the closest to the kings, this one that's smaller, and to the right, and then a third one. The third one, the furthest away, we don't know who occupied that one. The middle one, we know his name because an inscription has it. His name is Nebit. The closest one to the king's pyramid is that of a man named Sobek M. Chat. Now, Egyptologists are convinced which of these would have been the first vizier of, of Sosris III's reign, which would be the second, and which would be the third chronologically. Which do you think is first? Who? Joseph. Sobek Amhat was first. Why? His was built the closest to the king. And they were further away as the you know, new viziers uh, took on their office. Now, Think about the chronology for a minute. Joseph is still second in command two years into the famine when Jacob brings his family down to Egypt, right? He's still second in command. So technically, if Joseph takes the office of second in command in Egypt under the famine pharaoh, who's the Sosteris III, and he holds it again in two years into the famine, and I already told you Sosteris III takes the reign, uh, begins his reign right in the transition between the abundance and the famine years, then who has to be on the throne it, biblically? Who has to be in the position of vizier at the very beginning of Sesostris III's reign? Joseph. Has to be. Where is Sobek Amchat? First vizier under Sesostris III. Fits the historical chronology perfectly. That's a blow up of the pyramid of Sesostris III and the royal pyramids around it and the the courtyard around that and the walls that are around it. This is a close-up of the Mastabas of Sobek Amkat to the left, Nebit in the center, and an uncertain one on the right. And by the way, you see that uh, the wife's tomb of, of Sobek Amkat is to the upper area. 
Um, the French archaeologists who excavated Sobek Amkat's uh, Mastaba determined that the owner of this tomb, who was buried there, his body was robbed out in antiquity. What happened to Joseph? His body was delivered to Canaan and buried. Fits the biblical chronology perfectly in the biblical history. So um, this will identify, these, these uh, uh, stone casing slabs will identify Nebit's Mastaba. Um, this inscription, um, especially this right here, this is part of Chati. That's undeniable, uh, one of the most important titles of a vizier, which means shrouded one. You know how Moses had this veil over him, right, to protect him from all the people because he sees the glory of God? It's the same idea in Egypt. Well, it's more or less the same idea that the vizier is the shrouded one. He is, you know, he's supreme. He's not among the common people. He's guarded from them. He's shrouded in mystery. So, then Sobek Sobak Emchat's name is attested on a mastaba at Dashur. So actually, um, the, this is the, the drawing of the remains of a quartzite offering table that was found in this first vizierial uh, mastaba, and it gives enough information to, um, to identify who is the person who lived there. And so basically what it tells us is, uh, okay, we have Emchat, okay. Here we have an owl that makes the M sound M. Here we have a, I don't believe it or not. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is Sobek M. So this is Sobek, that's an alligator. That's an M owl. And then this part is broken off and missing. So we have Sobek M on this quartzite offering table. And this is a reconstruction by a friend of mine who graduated from the University of Toronto, an Egyptologist. He reconstructed the entire thing and he'll be publishing this. This is absolutely unpublished. Uh, that he'll be publishing with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. His name's Kei Yamamoto. So he did an excellent job with this. And as he restores it, here is the lion with its paws, with its forepaws. And that is Chat in Middle Egyptian. So he suggests it reads Sobek M. Chat. And everyone uh, within the field of Egyptology agrees. On another um, stone slab found at the mastaba of Sobek Amchat was this partial inscription, which is the tail feathers of an owl, so the M sound. And it reads down, and here we have the lion with its paws, and then the bread loaf, which makes the T sound, and here it's redundant, M Chat, M Chat. So we take the quartzite offering table, Sobek M, and we take M Chat from here, we join them together, and it's the name Sobek M Chat. Um, a famous uh, Egyptologist named Simpson uh, is the one who wrote the article connecting this and, and uh, proving that, that that's the name of the vizier who occupied this mastaba. So, uh, I believe the last thing to look at for us is the funerary inscription of Sobek Amkat himself, which was not found in his mastaba. It was in complete form, um, unbroken, found in, uh, what, remember I told you there were other pharaohs who were buried at Dashur? Well, there's an underground uh, portion of Amenemkat II, an, an earlier pharaoh, uh, his, uh, his burial chamber, where there was a statue who, with, with its arms open like this, and the inscription, which is this right here, was laying in his arms, just sitting there, which tells us what? Well, number one, it's local. The, the inscription is local. But number two, it's in secondary context. But number three, it's telling us it was intentionally preserved for posterity. Isn't that amazing? Somebody purposefully made sure that this inscription wouldn't be obliterated or desecrated or removed. They hid it away. Isn't that fascinating? So I won't go through with all of the description of what a funerary inscription is. This is called a chetep tinesu. It's really kind of cool, but I'll skip all of that, and I'll go right down to the second to last line and give you some of these royal titles, uh, some of these high titles 
of this man, Sobek and Chad. And you can see his name is here. There's the alligator. It looks like a dog or a, or a horse kind of a thing, but it's an alligator. So Sobek M. Chad, that's his name. So here is the, the Ka of, or the spirit of, and then we have this title string. The first one, highlighted in brown, is um, member of the elite, which is only a, a title only given to the highest people under Pharaoh, the very highest. Then next is foremost of hand. That's also an extremely high title, not quite as high as member of the elite. Then we come to the one in dark blue. This is fascinating. Literally, it says, controller of the entire land. Controller of the entire land. This title is unknown anytime elsewhere in Egypt's history. It's never again, never before used. Never found. In fact, the world's foremost authority on Egyptian uh, titles of the 12th dynasty in the Middle Kingdom who's from Europe, I won't tell you his name, he even, uh, when he knew about this, this inscription, he didn't publish it, he referred to this, this title here, the controller of the entire land, he saw that, he knew it was wrong, and he amended the text to say something different in his book, to give it a different title, because he refused to believe that a man could hold the office of controller of the entire land because only Pharaoh holds that office. Here it is. Sobek Emchad is controller of the entire land. If you open your Bible to Genesis 41, 41, what are you going to see? Joseph is described as having control of all of Egypt. That's part of, you know, what he receives from the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh entrusted him with everything. Only in his title as Pharaoh would he be greater than Joseph. That's it. Everything else was in Joseph's hands, including controlling all of Egypt, which is exactly what you see in this title. And then the last title, he who has authority over every preeminent office. And if you look at verses 38 and 39, especially of Genesis 41, you'll see there that's something that Joseph received. He received authority over every other person in Egypt, save Pharaoh himself. So all of this describes perfectly some of the things that we see in the Bible that are true of Joseph. And again, everything matches, everything that archaeology can tell us, or epigraphy can tell us, it supports the biblical narrative. It authenticates the historicity in the biblical text which is absolutely phenomenal. And all of this, again, is going to be published in my book, uh, second book. So, um, all right. Uh, you know what? For time's sake, uh, how about if we end there? Any questions? I don't want to take more time than I should. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, why is uh, why does why does why is uh, uh, the, the name that is given in the scriptures for Joseph not he, which is an Egyptian name, not not uh, the Penea? Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you accept uh, Kenneth Kitchen's idea that we have a metathesis, and so it simply means uh, he was called Penea, which would mean the light or something like that? Um, so yeah, the question is uh, Joseph's biblical name. Uh, which we believe to be an Egyptian name. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it, and is you know, um, is it plausible that it could be the name that the, su the suggested meaning that Kenneth Kitchen suggests? I would say first of all, it, it's very difficult to know exactly what that name was to reconstruct it perfectly in the, into Middle Egyptian. There are even several opinions among Egyptologists. So I don't even know that we can say with certainty that we have the right breakdown of what it was in Egyptian. So I would say that Kitchen absolutely can be right. Mm -hmm. He may have it correct. And I think Hoffmeyer even, last I knew, Hoffmeyer supported Kitchen's view of the meaning. So it's, it's, very, it's very plausible. But the second question, I don't know if you, if you asked this or not, would be, and I've been asked this before, uh, 
why wouldn't we see that name for Joseph here in any of these inscriptions? That's a good question. I don't have an answer that is 100% satisfactory even to myself, but I would say this. Remember, every pharaoh had five names. Uh, Joseph has a Hebrew name. He has uh, an Egyptian name. Um, Jacob has two Hebrew names. Abram has two Hebrew names. Sarah has two Hebrew names. So, um, undoubtedly, uh, Jacob would have been called something in, in Egyptian. So he had at least three names, right? Well, um, I don't think it's implausible to suggest that Joseph had multiple names as well. So I just think that the name that got put down into Scripture is one of the names he was given. And remember, all of these are names assigned to them by Egyptians because of something they see in them. So I would just suggest that Joseph had multiple names because there were multiple factors distinguishing him, causing people to associate him with different things. So that which is handed down um, in, in Egyptian records is more momentary, it's official, and so forth. Probably the name that's recorded in the biblical text is, is more personal, maybe the one name that Joseph would have accepted most, or Ephraim and Manasseh would have accepted as being most um, endearing to them, and that's the name that found its way into the scripture. So that's pretty much how I'd answer. 